So it's wonderful to be here uh, in the White House. But I do have one housekeeping thing uh, to tell you. Uh, that it's a difficult situation. The IMLS is here today, and also, this is serious, the MLS, Major League Soccer, is here today. <laughs> and there's, there's been some confusion, so I have a note from the Social Secretary. Ted Lasso, your soccer team is looking for you. <laughs> anyway, uh, little joke, sorry. My one chance. Um, so we're honored by the presence today uh, of a number of members of uh, Congress. Uh, Representative Pallone uh, is here. Uh, Representative Tonko is here. Uh, Representative Grijalva, I believe, is here. Um, Representative Berrigan, thank you. Uh, Representative McCormick, no, I missed that. Uh, Representative Kaptur, no, sorry. Representative Hageman, I know, is here, yeah and Representative Moskowitz. No, sorry, we had a couple of planes we were missed. Um, and uh, we're also honored by the, uh, the presence uh, uh, today of uh, uh, Chair Lowe of the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, Shelley. Um, and, uh, and with us today are the board members uh, of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, 18 of whom are very new to the board and Biden appointees. Uh, but all of whom have distinguished themselves uh, in the cultural world. And in addition, there are six former members of the board who were integral uh, in uh, choosing our medalists today and collectively have devoted decades of service to our national efforts. And I offer a salute also to the Ford Foundation, a longtime partner of the cultural world and the IMLS. Would our board members and former board members please stand? Be recognized. The last time the Institute of Museum and Library Services was in the White House was for last year's National Student Poets Ceremony, very graciously hosted by the First Lady, Dr. Biden, our host once again, for which we are deeply grateful. Ada Limon, our wonderful poet laureate, spoke and recited as did an inspired group of five young, very young poets. Uh, but the most beautiful words we heard that day uh, were those of Dr. Biden herself who came to us directly from teaching her community college writing class in Northern Virginia. As I remember, she found the way to success in getting her protégés to higher levels of expression by asking them to write about something they loved as if explaining to a friend why they loved it. Besides a Socratic resonance, this also reflects what is glorious about this ceremony today, about the work, the inspired work of our eight medalists and their communities. It is clearly work that you love, and more importantly, that is loved in your towns and cities. We have one library, Kuskokwim, and one museum, Jim Gatchell, that are tiny compared to the giants in our museum and library worlds, but who are central to the well-being and communal spirit of their citizens. We have two California institutions, one of modest size, which brings great art to the community and aspiring community artists into the museum and in the other, a great library system whose 80 branches are home to one of the complex, most complex and challenged demographics in our country, who are all depending for the library, for comfort in trying times. We have two science museums whose creativity, charisma, and character are educating their communities, children, and families for a dynamic and challenging future. And in New Jersey and Ohio, two libraries with long histories who have found new vigor in being not only in touch with their various communities within the community, but a leader for the future of those communities. We live in polarized times, which in the creative community is more necessary uh, than ever in bringing people together in a unifying, enlightening, and engaging way. These institutions are among the very best at doing that. I was in your place 15 years ago when as director of the Kansas City Public Library, we received the National Medal in this room from another gracious First Lady, Laura Bush. I know not only the thrill of being here, but also what this will mean to your staff in your museums and libraries as recognition in many cases of a lifetime of devoted work, but also what it will mean to your communities that they have such special institutions that embrace what is best in our world. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce not only one of the most gracious 
leaders of our nation, but also one of the most dedicated and inspiring supporters of the work that we do. She has been directly responsible for the President's reestablishment of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities, which is housed at the IMLS, and will this month have its first board meeting with Dr. Biden as honorary chair and full-time inspiration. Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady of the United States, Dr. Jill Biden. Director Kemper, and I'm so grateful for the, your tireless commitment to making museums and libraries accessible to all of us. I also want to thank the Institute of, of Museum and Library Sciences Services, excuse me, staff for all the work they've done to make these awards possible. So hello everyone and welcome to the White House. <laughs> When I was young, I'd walk to our local library every two weeks and take home as many books as I could carry in my arms. And I'll never forget the summer nights that my mom would let me stay up too late, well, one or two in the morning, so I could finish just one more chapter. The characters felt so real to me. A humble spider writing out some pig on her barn door. A magical nanny who held tea parties on the ceiling. As I poured over page after page, without even realizing it, I was learning. And I never wanted to stop. When a child falls in love with learning, a world of possibilities opens before her. And that is the gift that all of you give every day. In each book, each new exhibit, each reimagined way to connect with science or math or history or art, we see ourselves. Museums and libraries are living parts of our communities, changing as we do and teaching us new things with each visit. They weave together the stories of our nation, its past, present, and future and they safeguard our freedom to learn, to explore, and choose the ideas and philosophies that shape us without fear of being silenced or censored. As you may know, the White House is a museum and we have a library downstairs. And as we work to open the doors of this house wider and wider, we have seen that it too can grow and evolve and begin something new. And that's why we've worked with the Library of Congress to install a temporary exhibit of young adult and children's books in our library, because guess what? They weren't there. <laughs> I know, I was so shocked. So anyway, we want the children who visit to see themselves in this place so we can spark that lifelong love of learning that I found in the hallways of my hometown library. And I hope to make these books a permanent part of our living museum. We're here today to say that this work matters. It changes lives. Because of you, a student has discovered a lifelong love of science, inspiring her to, you know, pursue a career that she loves. A young person who needs a job can find the support to search for one. A parent is able to borrow the tools she needs to fix that broken bed frame or plant the garden where she can grow memories with her children. An artist can show the world his heart and the heritage that shaped him. In big cities and small towns, in suburbs and rural villages, you are a lifeline, a connection to the endless possibilities that exist within each of us. A place not to just discover dreams, but to make those dreams a reality. 
You show us what lies beyond the limits of our imaginations and how to listen to others' stories, to hear new perspectives and imagine new futures. You show us how to fight for what we believe in and ask us to take a moment to stop and appreciate the beauty in the world. You connect us to each other, teaching us understanding, kindness, and compassion. I know that your communities are so proud of you, and the President and I are so proud of you too. Thank you for everything you do. And now, I will ask each pair of awardees to join me on the stage as Director Kemper reads your citations. Accepting on behalf of the Center of Science and Industry, President and CEO, Dr. Frederick Bertley and Gitanjali Rao. Cozy is dedicated to making science accessible for all. I think maybe I should have done this at the beginning, so sorry for that. <laughs> Through each exhibit, this museum seeks to engage and excite people who think science is not for them. In addition to its on-site physical space, Cozy is helping more people access curated science experiences off-site in their communities, locally and globally, as well as online with their digital ecosystem. Congratulations to the Center of Science and Industry. do this the right way. Accepting on behalf of the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum, Director Sylvia Bruner and Keelan Byron. <laughs> Theodore James Jim Gatchell opened the first drug store in Johnson County, Wyoming in 1900. Gatchell met many people through his pharmacy, from cowboys to lawmen, settlers, cattle barons, and famous army scouts. Today, the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum celebrates the sense of community he fostered and embodies that same connection with the people, places, and past of this rural county. Congratulations to the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum. Accepting on behalf of the Kuskokwim Consortium Library, Library Director to Teresa Quiner and Michelle DeWitt. <laughs> For those living in this remote area, the role a library plays can have a big impact. Kuskokwim Consortium Library, which serves as an academic library for the University of Alaska, Fairbanks, Kuskokwim campus, and a public library, connects people to the resources they need. It helps its community, which can often be only reached by air or boat, access resources that allow them to embrace their environment, explore their Yupik culture, and participate in a modern, digitally driven world. Congrats, congratulations to the Kuskokwim Consortium Library. Accepting on behalf of the LA County Library, Library Director Sky Patrick and Julio Cesar Catalan Jr. This library system serves over 3.4 million residents through its 86 locations across Los Angeles. With a community this big, it can be easy for programs to get lost in the shuffle. 
But with their mission to break down barriers and increase access for all, the LA County Library staff always finds a way to make their work impact while reinforcing the library system's role in the community as a place that can support the whole person. Congratulations to the LA County Library. Accepting on behalf of the Long Branch Free Public Library, Director Tanya Garcia and Monique Bowles. Their, their staff's dedication to adapting programs and support to meet the needs of their community is at the heart of what they do. Serving a population of about 30,000, Long Branch Free Public Library knows even the most innovative ideas and programs can't out get off the ground without a supportive network backing them. That's why they credit their remarkable staff, volunteers, and trustees as the driving force behind its successful initiatives, services, and programs. The independent library is, this independent library is dedicated to changing patrons' lives and helping them reach their fullest potential. Congratulations to the Long Branch Free Public Library. Accepting on behalf of the Museum of Discovery and Science, President and CEO Joseph Cox and Philip Dunlap. The museum's goal is to ensure that all visitors' experiences are inspiring and give individuals the opportunity to participate in creating a better place. Since 1977, their mission has been to connect people to inspiring science by creating engaging experiences and evolving to meet the needs of their community. As our world evolves, the museum changes by listening, reacting, and staying engaged with what matters. Congratulations to the Museum of Science and Discovery. Accepting on behalf of the Riverside Art Museum, uh, Executive Director Drew Oberjurge and Juan Navarro. <laughs> With a mission to engage, inspire, and build community through the arts by presenting thought-provoking exhibitions and art education programs, Riverside Art Museum is driven by the power of the arts to bring people together to connect. The museum believes that art promotes empathy and understanding of others and in turn uplifts human dignity of all people. Congratulations to the Riverside Art Museum. Accepting on behalf of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library in Ohio, Executive Director Jason Kuzma and Aya uh, Khalil. <laughs> the goal of Toledo Lucas County Public Library is to be the first place people turn when they want to broaden their horizons or connect with one another. Books and traditional library programming are a part of that, but the services they've designed to support their diverse community are many. The thriving library system where one mantra is books are just the beginning is a significant driver in the residents' quality of life. Congratulations to the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Congratulations once again to the 2023 winners of the National Medal for Museum and Library Service.
all of you are making such a difference. And I hope your stories inspire those in this room and beyond to never stop looking for ways to reach out and help their neighbors and their communities. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, please enjoy our reception. Thank you. Distinguished guests. Hello, welcome back. Wait, nobody likes my outfit. <laughs> I'm not quite understanding this. It's okay. There might be issues if people start commenting on my outfit. Okay, so first I want to officially. We welcome Kelly O'Donnell uh, as the new president of the White House Correspondents Association and thank you to, she's not here, but thank you to Tamara Keith for her partnership over the last year. Uh, very few people understand just how much work is required by the WHCA and the White House uh, to ensure press coverage and related travels as smoothly as possible. And we are looking forward to working closely with you, Kelly O, and uh, in, the ne in this next chapter. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm excited about it. So I have a couple, two things at the top, and welcome to uh, anyone who traveled with us abroad. Welcome back. Hopefully you got some rest over the weekend. But the first thing I want to talk about um, it's on a subject that's gotten increasing attention over the last few weeks, certainly the last couple of days. And I want to quote a Republican senator in 2022. So bear with me here. Quote, leaving our military in limbo is never the right thing to do, end quote. That same senator also said, quote, our military isn't a political pawn. The year before this Republican senator declared, and I quote, our job as elected official is to make sure that those who have stepped up to defend our country have the resources that need that they need to do their job and to do it safely. Strangely though, that person who said these things seem seems to have seems to have forgotten them and that person as you all know because you've all covered this very closely is Tommy Tuberville. So right now, Senator Tuberville is hijacking what was, has traditionally been a bipartisan process, the National Defense Authorization Act. He's also delaying the confirmation of hundreds of qualified and capable military nominees, depriving our armed forces of leadership it needs. The Pentagon is going without a Senate-confirmed Marine Corps commandant for the first time ever in over a century because of this attack on our national security. A cascading effect of delayed promotions threatens to brain drain from the military. And military families do not know where they will live, where spouses will work, where children will go to school. Senator Tuberville him said, him, himself said in 2021, and I quote of course, military spouses make sacrifices every day for their country. They are the backbones and support systems for our troops, often balancing this with family life, moving towns, and being separated from loved ones. Senator Tuberville from 2021 and 2022 should intervene with 2023 Senator Tuberville, because clearly there's a problem here. And Republican senators need to speak out on behalf of our national security and military families. That's something that you heard from President Biden at his press conference in Helsinki, so I'm just reiterating that. Republicans and senators need to speak up. Now also uh, have one more thing that I wanna share before I turn it over to the Admiral, because uh, we don't get many opportunities to say what I'm about to share. And so I wanna make sure that these words uh, come out very clearly. And uh, I'm sure she'll be very shocked that, I, that, that I'm saying this, which is we agree with Majority Taylor Green, which is not something that we say very often. Over the weekend, the Congresswoman uh, Majority Taylor Greene criticized Binomics as being in line with the FDR's creation of Social Security, Lyndon Johnson's creation of Medicare. She also bizarrely attacked Binomics because it's reducing poverty in rural areas. We agree with her all around, all around on this. 
We are opposed to rural poverty, and the president is committed to protect Medicare and committed to protect Social Security, as you heard from him over and over again over the past several months. Now, to be fair, we are aware of her misgivings about Medicare and Social Security because she's a member of the Republican Study Committee, which recently, again, proposed cutting those very benefits. But this is the first time that we are aware of being attacked for trying to reduce rural poverty. Although we probably should have seen that coming since Majority Taylor Greene or Marjorie Taylor Greene is also trying to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, policies uh, that are responsible for high paying manufacturing jobs coming back to her own district. Now, President Biden looks forward to visiting her district, as you've heard him say many times before, to highlight those good paying jobs and the differences that they are making in the lives of real people on the ground in Georgia. And finally, as I just mentioned, as, as somebody just talked about his wonderful suit today, uh, the Admiral is here, John Kirby, uh, to take a few questions on some policy, foreign policy uh, news of the day, uh, including Russia's uh, suspicion of the uh, Black Sea Grain, Grain Initiative, uh, the President's call, as you all know, with the Prime Minister of Israel and the President's, uh, and also Israel's President's visit tomorrow. And with that, Kirby, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. So I want to start today uh, by addressing Russia's irresponsible and dangerous decision to suspend its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which will exacerbate food scarcity and harm millions of vulnerable people around the world. Yeah, well, I'm not sure the microphone yeah, works. Yeah, we can't hear you. I, same for KJP. Yeah, we can Sorry about that. Maybe we can. I will contact someone. Should I just yell? Yeah. <laughs> I can do that. You're on deck. <laughs> Admirals can do that. Um, is that better? Sounds like it is. No? no yeah? I don't think no. So. Okay. Give us, just give us a second. I want to make sure you're heard. <laughs> is it okay if we just start if in the back? No? Maybe I could hear it, but then same with you. It's just it's muted today. Okay, gotcha. I'll try to uh, I'll try to project. We'll do, we'll do our best. I've had my grandkids for the last two and a half weeks, so projecting is something I'm good at right now. Um, I want to start today by addressing Russia's irresponsible and dangerous decision to suspend its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which will exacerbate food scarcity and harm millions of vulnerable people around the world. The Black Sea Grain Initiative has been critical to bringing down food prices, which have spiked as a result of Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. More than half of the 33 million metric tons of grain and foodstuffs that have been shipped through the initiative have gone to developing countries, including some of the most food insecure regions of the globe. These shipments have helped drive down and stabilize global prices. And every shipment under the initiative has contributed to reducing hardship in the world's poorest countries since bringing grain to world markets lowers food prices for everybody. Russia's decision to resume its effective blockade of Ukrainian ports and prevent this grain from getting to markets will harm people all over the world. Russia will be fully and solely responsible for the consequences of this military act of aggression. Indeed, we are already seeing a spike in global wheat, corn, and soybean prices just today as a result of Russia's suspension. We urge the government of Russia to immediately reverse its decision. Meanwhile, the United States has and we will continue to work with uh, other countries to enable both Russian and Ukrainian grain to reach the rest of the world, including by ensuring that our sanctions do not target, contrary to Russian propaganda, they do not target Russian food or fertilizer, and we will continue to support Ukraine's efforts to get that grain to markets that desperately need it, even if that's through other routes. A lot of work to be done here. This is a deeply regrettable and, as I said, a dangerous decision that we urge Mr. Putin to reverse. Now, just quickly, uh, a readout on uh, the president's uh, discussion uh, today with Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. They obviously talked about a broad range of global and regional issues of mutual concern. The president underscored his ironclad, unwavering commitment to Israel's security. Please join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the Makad TV family. 
Please like and share MCAD TV. We love you all. Please support MCAD TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.